Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, I know that your community has been um, rocked with uh, suicides, and uh, we're glad to be here to, to hopefully help out and, and spark a little conversation of what we can do as a community uh, effort to help save lives from suicide. So, um, as Chandler said, this program is called Talk Saves Lives. Basically, uh, you know, the, the idea of it is that if we can talk about suicide in our community uh, and get rid of some of the <coughs> stigma and the taboo that's around suicide, that we can help save lives uh, and bring, um, you know, bring some programs like this one and, and more intense ones to your community so that uh, the effort that I see here today of, of all of you could um, be a part of um, a suicide safer community. So thank you for your, your time today. Uh, this is about 40 to 45 minutes, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, since it is, uh, you know, has touched your community, uh, some of the things we've talked about or just some of the, uh, you know, the words in, you know, in the program uh, might trigger somebody. Uh, and that's okay, we want you to uh, have a safe environment here as we go through the training. So if anybody uh, you know, is triggered by anything, please take care of yourself. Uh, if you need to step out and get some air, that is fine. Uh, it's sometimes it's a tough subject for some of us. Uh, if you are just you know, heading out to the ladies' or men's room, uh, just give us a thumbs up on your, on your way out so that we know you're okay. Uh, otherwise, uh, someone's going to track you down and, and follow you. Right? really don't want to chase anybody into the ladies room today. Uh, but we do want a safe environment, and it, and it can be a, a tough subject. So again, uh, this is a great just kind of uh, beginning to, um, to what suicide uh, is about, some of the logistics behind it, what's going on with, um, with our community, uh, our communities within uh, Massachusetts, especially where we work, uh, to, to help prevent suicide. So, as we go through this, uh, suicide uh, is, a, is a public health issue in 19, I'm sorry, 2004, the Attorney General um, declared that it was a suicide, uh, public health, that suicide was a public health issue and uh, brought it to the forefront of uh, our government so that we could get funding for suicide <coughs> prevention work. Uh, Massachusetts uh, leads the United States in funds per capita for suicide prevention, which is, which is great news. So we can um, get some of this work done, and also AFSP has been uh, extremely strong in our in our state in raising funds and awareness. Uh, it's a very complex uh, health issue. It's different than most of our other health issues that we deal with. So, you know, even though it is, um, you know, complex and hard to understand, we can help prevent suicide, and anybody really can in your community. A lot of people think that we need to have our, you know, social workers, our psychologists, um, you know, our, our mental health workers uh, in the field uh, do that work. But it's really a community-based effort. And um, beyond what we're going to go over today, there are several trainings that we offer, and hopefully we can come back to your community and, and uh, give you a broader uh, training in how to do interventions, uh, you know, really how to help someone uh, beyond. Um, you know, just knowing the, the simple maybe warning signs that you might uh, we might talk about a little bit about today. So um, anybody in the room, um, and I, uh, who cares? And I'm sure that all of you in here too, or you wouldn't be sitting in the room, you know, during your lunch break today. I'm sure you'd be uh, doing something a little more exciting than talking about suicide. Uh, but anybody really, you know, can help prevent suicide. And, uh, I'm glad that you know this is a good start. We have we have as many, many people in the room. So we're going to go over some statistics briefly. I won't bog you down with them. We'll go over some worldwide statistics. Statistics, some uh, you know in our area, um, well, in the United States and in, in our in our state of Massachusetts. Um, as we go through some of them, if there's any questions, feel free to ask. Um, it, it makes for a better hour if people are engaged and have questions. So. Not going to make you know you wait to the end for questions. If you have something, raise your hand and, and we'll, we can address it as we go. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about the research. Um, there's some cutting edge research that's being done as far as um, uh, medically with, with studying the brain um, and other uh, you know, other medical 
um, ways to see how someone is at risk. Uh, and also just the research that has been done over probably the last 30 years when um, we started in the United States really uh, keeping track of, of suicide numbers and um, what is, you know, or what can be some of the causes of, of suicide. Uh, we'll go over a little bit of the prevention work, talk about some warning signs, some risk factors, uh, some common things, you know, of that sort, and, and maybe within your communities and um, your workplaces, maybe you've dealt with some of these signs and, and can contribute to something that you know we might not go over. And then we'll talk a little bit about what we can do. And then beyond that, not only what we can do to help someone at risk, but also what we can do as a community, as I said, moving for, you know further down the road with uh, with more trainings and getting more involved. So we'll start with statistics. Uh, 800,000 people worldwide die by suicide. Uh, you know, per year, or over 800,000. It's quite a large number. Does that shock anybody? It's a big number. So, you know, and, and the ones of us who do this work, we feel that that number is low. But we have to be recording of it. Because some of the countries uh, don't report suicides the way, you know, the United States does, or other, uh, other countries. So. Uh, we feel that that number, you know, is probably about 10 to 15 percent higher than that. So that's quite shocking if you if you think about it. Uh, so that that comes out to every 40 seconds that someone dies in, in the world by suicide. In the United States, it's the tenth leading cause of death. As you can see, that number there, over 42,000 people died in the United States in 2014. That's the last year that we have the statistics for. It takes a while for us to gather uh, all those numbers. So, uh, you know, it, just for perspective, since we're outside of Boston, that would more than fill Fenway Park's capacity. That's a lot of people that have died by suicide in our country. Uh, and again, um, we feel that that number or that statistic is low uh, for, for a couple of reasons. One, as I said before, some of the reporting that, that is done isn't accurate. Um, and, and sometimes we feel that uh, a suicide is not reported as a suicide, but it might be reported as something else. Any ideas of what that might be? A couple of things might be reported as overdose. overdoses. So we really have an epidemic in, in our, especially in our area, but in our country on, on heroin and other opiate addiction. And we've lost a lot of people uh, either to overdose over the past couple of years. So we feel that, um, you know, there could be a, a, a large part of those numbers that are intentional overdoses. And without clear intent, it won't be ruled as a, as a suicide. Um, so there has to be clear intent before the coroner can, can mark it as a suicide rather than uh, an accidental um, death, which, which an overdose would be, would be um, notated as. Any other reason, any other kind of deaths that might not show up as a suicide but could be a suicide? An accident. I'm sorry? An accident. An accident. So there's a term, I really don't like the term, but it's called auto side. So it's, you know, a, a single um, car crash, uh, a single person car crash where it was high speed involved, uh, no break marks, skid marks um, into a tree or a bridge abutment or something of that sort. So sometimes those are just rolled as accident. Again, there needs to be intent. And to show intent, there has to be some sort of um, clear um, delivery that the person uh, who died uh, left behind. Uh, and, and not too many people that, you know, not a large percentage, I should say, of people that die by suicide actually leave a note. It's about 30%. So you have 70% that um, die by suicide. Don't leave a note. So that those single car crashes or the overdoses, a lot of the times there is, there is no clear intent involved. Uh, and then you know there's also several other you know um, accidents that are possible. The other one that comes to mind uh, is drowning. Um, we, we know that people take their life by drowning um, who have made it clear and, and you know, there was clear intent involved. Uh, but sometimes there's drownings with and there's a bit of mystery to them. Um, and that could also be a, uh, a suicide call. So for every suicide, there's 25 
attempts, and that's United States, we're, we're staying with statistics from the United States. So uh, in our communities it's 25 to one. That would bring us somewhere around um, or close to a million um, suicide attempts a year. And again, we feel that number is low because that's just recorded attempts. Now that's the ones that you know get recorded in the emergency rooms uh, or by police or another first responder. So it's a, another figure that we, we feel isn't, um, you know, or could be you know, 10 to 15% higher than, than what it shows. So each suicide leaves behind an average of 115 people. So that's a tough number to you know, pinpoint, but that's the number they've come up with. It used to be a lot lower, but as we've done more research and you know, opened up the conversation around suicide in the community, uh, that number rose quite a bit. Uh, just think about where you work or your town here. Um, if someone dies by suicide, how many people might be affected? Um, start with the, you know, the school system or um, you know, the, the workers in the school system, the, um, the community itself, maybe the faith-based community had a part of it, uh, and then you know, friends and family. So it has quite an impact on a community uh, when someone dies by suicide, as, as probably many of, of you in here know. And then there's the economic part of it. They said $44 billion is lost uh, a year to, to suicide um, in our economy due to uh, mostly lost wages and, and lack of production for them, you know, from those who have, who have passed. So before I jump into the research, just a couple other statistics uh, that we'll, we'll touch on a little bit when we do some prevention talk, but uh, just because it, it kind of, when we're talking about saving lives in the community, it's, it's knowing who would be at risk um, or, or the numbers of people that might be at higher risk. So, it, you know, across the board in the United States, uh, men die by suicide four times the rate, or almost four times the rate of women. Women attempt four times. So, does that make sense to you? Why, would that, why might that be that women attempt four times as much, but men die almost four times as much? The method. The method. So men <coughs> tend to use more a lethal me method, um, usually firearms or hanging, where uh, a lot of our uh, women that attempt suicide uh, are by poisoning uh, pills or poisons that you know, are around our, house, our household and uh, <coughs> have you know, left but less of a, a lethal um, you know, consequence to them. And what other reason might, if, if that's the case, what might happen to a woman that might not happen to a man in our society when they have an attempt? Emotions about children. What's that? Emotions about their family and children. Okay, emotions about their family. Are you saying we're not emotion, we don't have emotions <laughs> about our family? Yeah. Not enough. more likely to get help. It's just the way we're built in our society. You know, women will ask for help uh, much more, you know, often than men will. And we're, we're trying to change that. As a male, I, I see it all the time, whether it's friends or family or coworkers, when somebody's struggling, uh, you know, they have a tough time reaching out. So uh, hopefully in our, in our society uh, these days, that's, that's changing a little bit, and I see it gradually changing, but you know, men put up that, that shield and that kind of bravado of um, and not asking for help as, as much. Have you seen any increase over the years, change in women, uh, in terms of more people with veterans, women veterans, and using a method more than both? So the research over the years has, has kind of stayed steady as far as the means that, the difference between men and women, the means that use. I do do work with the, with the veterans as, as well as the um, active uh, military. And the deaths that we have seen in the military are more lethal than you would see outside the military. And most of the times it is a firearm. So we, we have seen an increase um, specifically with veterans and military and, and, and the means that they use, uh, whether it's male or female. Uh, any other questions on statistics? 
So Massachusetts um, is usually 46, 47, or 48, somewhere around there every year uh, in, in the number of suicides, um, which is great that we're on the lower scale. But we still in Massachusetts had over 580 deaths by suicide in 2014. And that's, and that's we're one of the lowest. So our, our highest pockets of the United States uh, for suicide are the mountain states. So Colorado, Utah, Montana, uh, that area. Any, any ideas maybe why that would be? Isolation is definitely one of them. Uh, available help? Lack of. Yeah. Maybe lack of available help. Absolutely. Well, they probably have a lot more firearms. Than and a lot more firearms. We definitely uh, look at it, the research over the years, and that's, not, that's definitely the pocket of, of you know, area of the United States as well, where the firearms are up around 70% of, um, of the suicides that are. When you're ranking states, do you do it by population? Is it adjusted by population, or are you looking strictly at the number? No, it is just per, per 100,000. I don't have the number for, for mass off the top of my head for, for 100,000, but it is done by population. By population. I'm just curious if uh, there tends to be racial or class trends with suicides, or not really, it's across the board? Or okay, so in the, in the United States, everybody hear the question? I'm wondering about racial um, trends. In the United States, um, the highest number, again, not in total numbers, but per population, uh, is, is white, middle-aged men right now is the highest numbers of, of deaths by suicide. It was um, what they considered older, old, old white men, going back about six, seven years ago, maybe a little bit longer, which was 70 and older, were the highest rates of, of suicide in the United States. Um, and and uh, now it's middle-aged men is, is the highest rates. As far as race, um, the behind um, white males in the United States is um, Native American. Uh, an extremely high rate of suicide. So there isn't um, there isn't much change in any of the rates of of race, um, but there are um, some pretty steady numbers over the years that um, you know, that that have held true, which is you know the white um, white males per hundred thousand are the highest, and then the Native Americans. Any other questions on statistics? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about research. So we do research because we want to know why people take their lives. As I said earlier, suicide is very complex. There isn't usually one reason why somebody would take their life. So when we talk about suicide, we talk about precipitating factors. Many things that go on in a person's life to bring them to that point where they would consider suicide as an option. We hear a lot of times when someone dies by suicide that you know, maybe they went through a, a tough divorce or they lost their job and therefore they lost you know, um, maybe you know, their house or, or their car or the financial needs to do things. Um, and, and, and we kind of try to pinpoint that because we want answers. We want to know why someone dies by suicide, but it's always or I should say most of the time, much more complex than that. And if you look into it over the years of the research that we've done, we see that there are many precipitating factors um, that contributed to, to one's suicide, and that's usually not just a single action or, or a single life event. We had um, a case in Western Mass many years back where the, a young lady unfortunately took her, her life um, after being bullied. I don't know how many of you remember that, and, and the bullying campaigns came out in all the schools, which I think is great. The thing in our world, though, we didn't want bullying tied to suicide because bullying wasn't the only factor in that young woman's life that you know drove her to take her own life. There were many things after it was investigated that had happened prior to that. A suicide attempt had already happened before the bullying. Um, you know, there was separation and anxiety from family that lived in another country. Uh, there were mental health issues that were already um, being addressed, medication that 
was helping and then wasn't being taken anymore. So there were a lot of different reasons for, for that person's um, suicide. And, and we try to pinpoint one thing because we want an answer, but it's usually much, much more complex than that. So this statistic has held true o over quite some time now that nine out of 10 people that die by suicide did have a mental health condition. So when we talk about that and say, well, how did, how did we know that? Um, if, if the statistics aren't exact, how are we, how are we s sticking to that nine out of 10? That's 90% of people who die by suicide had a mental health condition. It is, uh, and, and sometimes it's, di it's gone di undiagnosed, which we, again, we say, well, how do you keep track of those statistics? Um, we know that from people who have attempted suicide, that that number holds true as well, that 90% of them have had a mental health condition or they've already been diagnosed, uh, or are diagnosed uh, after their attempt of, of having one. So it's, it's not perfect science when they say nine out of 10, but it's a, a, a number that we can keep track of and realize that if nine out of 10 people that are dying by suicide have a mental health condition, that we need to do something better in our society to handle mental health. And it's something that we've swept under the carpet for a long time in our country. And we're trying to get better, uh, better at it. We're, we've spent the last five years really concentrating on, on better, you know, mel uh, mel excuse me, health care uh, management, uh, more providers, easier access, better, um, you know, better laws within our system, working with the insurance companies so that people can, you know, go see a mental health professional uh, and, and get the help that they need. Could you give examples of mental health problems that are related to suicide? That are related to suicide, sure. We're going to touch on that, but I'll uh, in a few. But so depression is one of the most common that we see in suicide as a mental health issue. Anxiety, um, drug and alcohol disorders, um, bipolar, schizophrenia. Those are probably the. the four or five most prevalent mental health conditions that someone would have that dies by suicide. And again, it does not mean that everyone that has depression thinks about suicide, that everyone that has anxiety thinks about suicide, that everyone that goes through a bipolar uh, throughout their life has thoughts of suicide. They are just at higher risk. So I just want to make that clear because it's, it, you know, people can struggle with depression you know, at one time, they can have major depression throughout their life. They can go in and out of depression throughout their life. It doesn't mean that they're thinking about suicide. It does mean that they're at higher risk, though. So, so one in four people, so 25% of us in this room will suffer from a mental health condition at some point in your life. Most of us are not going to go on to suicide. So again, the correlation, I don't want you to think that if you have a mental health disorder that you know, you're at risk for su you're at risk for suicide automatically. That that's going to be a part of your life. It's just you might be at a higher risk than someone without the mental health disorder. And unfortunately, out of that 25 percent, a large percentage of us do not get the help that we need. It goes undiagnosed for most of our lives. I think they say there might even be in here, but it's a it's a it's a a low number of people that. Get, actually get help that struggle with a mental health condition. So some of the interesting stuff for us in this world of suicide prevention is that they're starting to make great strides as far as seeing some um, changes in, in the body that, would, that we could see beforehand, maybe, that would show us that someone's at higher risk. So the development of the brain is one of them. And in the areas um, that, they've, you know, that they've been able to um, you know, say that the, the certain area of the brain is used for um, you know, decision making. Certain areas of the brain um, are, are used for um, problem solving. That the changes are different in someone's brain that is either thinking of suicide or has died by suicide. We also are doing a lot of research on um, concussion issues. 
So we we know that um, CTE is, everybody know what CTE is, a, a condition of um, someone gets from, from many concussions, blows to the head, a lot of our football players, a lot of our sports figures have, have had this problem. Even, even in our high schools and, and colleges, uh, as young as that age, in, people have you know, played a, a contact sport, uh, two or three con concussions, and their brain has, is developing different or has changed um, compared to what it was before compared to a brain that is healthy. So we have lost some of our uh, famous athletes to suicide because they were, you know, not because they were diagnosed with CT, but they were diagnosed with CT, and that was, you know, uh, one of the contributing factors to their suicide. So most people who die by suicide are ambivalent. Can somebody give me a definition of, of ambivalent? <clears throat> or take a stab at it? It's, it's a word that a lot of us don't use. Don't care. Okay. Unemotional. Okay. Uh, two minds. Two minds? That's a good way to put it. I like that. I haven't heard that before. Two minds. So, Really, ambivalence is, when we're talking with, with suicide, ambivalence is two minds, and I like that. I'm gonna, you mind if I steal that? All right, so what it is is someone who's struggling with suicide is ambivalent about whether they really want to die. There's a part of them that wants to live, but there's a part of them that really wants to die, that wants to end that pain that they're dealing with in their head. I'll tell you a quick story, because I know we're on a short time here, but. What a colleague of ours, uh, his name is Kevin Hines. Has anybody heard about Kevin Hines? <coughs> Kevin Hines is one of the few persons that has jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge to die by suicide and, and live through it. So he talks about his ambivalence right up to the point of his suicide attempt. Right up to his suicide attempt, Kevin talks about his ambivalence. He was an 18-year-old kid who took a bus a long bus ride all the way to the bridge uh, from his house and was crying the entire way there and he said to himself, if one person asks uh, what's wrong with me, I'll tell them my whole story and I'll ask them to help me. He'd been struggling with bipolar and, and suicide ideation for years and no one ever came out and asked him. They got him help for his bipolar, but no one ever came out and asked him, are you thinking about suicide? So he said if someone stopped him, he would, he would tell them everything. So he was on the bus and he was visibly crying. The bus was full. The last stop was Golden Gate Bridge. No one asked him what was wrong with him. No one said a word to him. He walked up to the edge of the bridge, right on the edge, ready to jump. And he still had in his mind, if one person asks me what's wrong, you know, I'll tell him everything. A lady came up to him and said, excuse me. And as he turned, she said, will you take my picture? <laughs> He's visibly crying. He took his picture, as he says, he took, you know, her, her picture, a couple snapshots. He said he wanted to do a nice thing before he died. He handed her camera back and said, see, nobody cares, and jumped off the bridge. He survived, and he tells his story, and he tells it a lot better than I do, and I like, I like when, he, when he tells it. If you look up Kevin Hines, you can get snippets of it, or maybe his whole story um, on YouTube or one of the other um, outlets. Uh, but. The importance of his story is that ambivalence. Up to the time, the immediate time of his death, he had that ambivalence. And this is how we know we can save lives. Because most people that have had a suicide attempt and, and lived through it tell us that they've had that ambivalence. They didn't really want to die. They just wanted to stop the pain. So that's how we know we can save lives. If we can recognize the signs, if we can recognize the symptoms, and know some of the risk factors, and know some of the statistics that put somebody at greater risk. We might be able to help them. So, the perspective, the, the crisis point that someone reaches, and as I already said, the, the pain becomes so unbearable in someone's mind that they just want it to stop. They want that pain to end. So, their option for that pain to end becomes suicide. It becomes one of their options. And when we talk to people who are suicidal, most of them say, I don't want to die. I just want that pain to stop. And when it gets to that point, their thinking might become irrational. 
And that's when they might be take that impulsive act of making a suicide attempt. So think of you know, something that was very painful in your life. Maybe you lost someone close to you, or you lost your job, or something happened that really rocked your world. And right at that moment, you know, where you have that pain, you know, how, how well was your thinking? How well were you, was your decision making? You know, would, would it bother you? You know, would it change, you know, how you feel and, and uh, how you think uh, and what decisions you might make? Or if somebody asked you for a simple direction somewhere or some advice, would you be, able, would you be clear enough to, you know, to, to give them that when you're underneath that, that much pain? So that's where suicide, um, you know, becomes an option when they're, with, you know, having that much pain. So the goals of research um, that they're doing, the, the biomarkers, so uh, they're doing testing now on blood uh, as well that uh, there, there's been s not enough evidence yet, but several suggestions that a certain um, genetic factor in, in the blood will also show that someone is at higher risk for suicide. Not that they're going to have an attempt, not that they're going to die by suicide, but just that it would put them at higher risk. Uh, intervention. So, as I said, you know, beyond um, what we've, what we'll talk about today, there are uh, interventions, um, you know, or, or different types of interventions uh, being taught all the time how to help someone in crisis. Um, the the uh, medical field uh, has taken on uh, a challenge with their mental health workers that they will all be trained some sort of intervention. Because as we started doing intervention trainings about eight years ago, um, a lot of the people that signed up for our work were mental health workers. We had psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, um, licensed mental health counselors. And after learning an intervention or doing an intervention training, they said that's more work they had on suicide prevention than they learned in their 8, 10, 12 years of school. So that was pretty shocking to us. Because we said, well, why? How are these people that are on the forefront of helping someone who, is, who could be in, in a suicidal crisis not trained in, in some sort of intervention? So we're do doing a lot more intervention work. Uh, psychotherapies, different types of therapies that, um, that have come about you know, over the past few years. Uh, Different, uh, different methods of, of treating depression, different methods of uh, talk therapies that, that help someone who's struggling with anxiety or bipolar or one of those other mental health conditions. Uh, and medication, so, you know, we're all always, they're always trying new medications for, for someone uh, who's, who's struggling with a mental health issue. And it's kind of a, a combination um, of, of talk therapies uh, and medication that is usually helpful when someone's in a suicidal crisis. Uh, we know that some medications have been uh, very <coughs> uh, effective in treating some mental health conditions, such as bipolar. Um, my friend Kevin there that I was talking about, he uh, balances his life uh, between therapy and medication. But that medication also becomes, um, your body becomes you know, adapted to it or used to it. Uh, so medications are, are constantly being researched and, and changed so that you can keep up, uh, you, know, um, you know, keep treating that mental health condition without uh, your body shutting down with the medication it's already taking. So who's at risk? Who do you guys think is at risk for suicide? Everyone. Everyone. And it doesn't mean that everyone ha will have suicide ideation or could at any point. Some of us will never have it. It's just not something that enters. But when we say who's at risk, we, we talk about it. We have, you know, we have factors that put people at higher risk. Um, but but we're, there's, no one's immune to suicide. And what I mean by that, no, no, no race, no religion, um, you know, no, you know, um, no sex. You know, it doesn't matter. You can be at a higher risk, like as we were talking earlier, if you fall into a certain category. But you know, anybody, really, anybody can be at risk, and that's, you know, important to know, because I think in our own lives, we seem to dismiss sometimes, you know, the, the idea of suicide. 
that's not going to happen to me. It's not going to happen to my community. It's not part of my life. It's not going to happen to someone in my family. It's just not there. But because we think that doesn't mean that the person that's very close to you thinks the same way. So keep that in mind. So some of the risk factors. So we talked about some health issues. Uh, you know, someone that's struggling, as Kevin wants, with bipolar is at higher risk. Um, you know, the other, the other risk factors we mentioned, the depression, the anxiety. So, you know, as we do prevention work, you know, we want to know the people around us, whether it's a student in our classroom, whether it's our, our friend or our family, uh, or a family member, or our, our coworker. You know, if, if you know that, you know, they're, they're struggling with some sort of mental health condition, that, that they're at higher risk. Also with health, it could be uh, a physical ailment or a, a terminal illness that, that might have someone uh, thinking about suicide. Um, so then there's some historical factors which we'll, we'll go through and, and some environmental as well. So we talked about most of these. These are the, when you asked your question, these are the most um, prevalent ones we see with suicide. Again, it doesn't mean that everyone that has one of these conditions is going to have thoughts of suicide. It just means over the years of research that they are at higher risk. So other health factors, chronic uh, health conditions, serious or chronic pain. Now, when we think of serious or chronic pain, we think of maybe someone that has had back problems for a long time in their life, and they're always in pain through the back. Or they have a shoulder condition, and they're always in pain. You know, your brain can have the same kind of pain that, you know, would, that can make, uh, make you not be able to perform and not be able to uh, go through your daily activities just as much as a, a physical pain. They say that someone that suffers from major depression uh, disorder that is as uh, debilitating as someone that is paraplegic. It can cause you not to be able to physically get yourself up out of bed, get yourself up out of your house to get through your normal daily activities. And we talked you know, about the, the, the um, head injuries a little bit. Environmental factors that might put somebody more at risk, the means, um, as I said, in, in um, you know, it's, it's, sometimes it's hard to you know, restrict means when we talk about um, you know, prevention, but as long as we know and we're aware of uh, you know, what those means could, you know, might be. Uh, in Massachusetts, are, uh, we have a very low number of suicide, suicides by firearm uh, because we have very strict gun laws. So the access to that means is less here than in other countries, uh, other states. In Massachusetts, the, the number one method of dying by suicide is hanging. And that's a tough one to, you know, to remove or say, part of our prevention work, we're going to uh, make the access to the means um, less available, which you, you, with, with hanging, it's really hard. One of the, the, the second one, though, which is um, with the second method in Massachusetts when people die by suicide, is poisoning, which includes um, overdose, pill taking. And that's something we can control in our households. Um, we have, um, you know, a lot of people just have medication lying around their house. They've had an ailment, they didn't finish it, uh, or, you know, it was something for, uh, you know, a, a accident you had and you had some pain, so they gave you pain medication. It's, you know, you didn't need it after the first few days and it's lying around the house. So that's something just to be aware of, the access of, of the means of, of medication. Um, I was working with some, some kids a few months ago, and they were telling me, and this is, wasn't about suicide, but just to bring up the, the access to, to pills and medication in their house, uh, they were telling me that they have what they call Skittles parties. Has anybody heard of that? So they just take a bunch of pills, or they stockpile pills from their, their, their house, and then they show up at, you know, on the weekend at, at you know, one of their friend's house and they just dump all these pills into a bowl. And they take handfuls at a time just to see what effect they're going to get, how high they can get off of a handful of pills. That's a scary thought. But that's how easy it is for these kids to have access to a means of suicide if they have a, you know, the access to the means to have those pills to take to a party. Um, so exposure. Uh, another environmental factor, exposure to suicide puts you at higher risk. Uh, if someone uh, close to you has died by suicide, statistically, you're at higher risk. Um, 
contagion um, is a word that we use in suicide prevention. It is not the, uh, people get confused with contagious. Suicide is not contagious. Although we did have a mother last week um, or last month that said uh, that she would not let her daughter play with the neighbor's daughter anymore because the older brother took his life and that she didn't want her daughter to catch whatever bad you know, thing they had going on in their house. It's horrible. I mean, that's how bad it can be out there, just talking about suicide. Um, contagion, though, is, uh, I'll give you an example of contagion. When I first started doing this, I was working down the Cape, and in Sandwich High School, they had a death of one of their star athletes, um, uh, senior, uh, you know, had everything going for him, took his life. On the six-month anniversary, a close friend took their life. And then on the year anniversary, another one within the school system took their life. That's a contagion. It, it, it follows a pattern of someone knowing, you know, another person that, you know, had died by suicide. Uh, and then obviously stressful life events are definitely an environmental factor that would increase your, uh, your risk of suicide. So a historical factor, family history of suicide. Again, if someone who's close to you has died by suicide, you are at higher risk. Uh, mental health conditions, we know that some of them are genetic and are passed on by generation or skip generations. Um, so that's something to watch out for. Childhood abuse or any abuse. It doesn't just have to be childhood abuse. I think there's abuse that could start at any point of your life um, that can be traumatic enough that could be uh, one of the risk factors for suicide. Uh, and a pre previous suicide attempt. Most people who have a suicide attempt and live through it. Are, do not die by suicide. Do not take another attempt on their life. But the statistics still show that if you've had a suicide attempt, you are at higher risk. So, what others know? So, again, I'll go back to where we were talking, what I said earlier about if someone dies by suicide, it, what do we know? We usually don't know much, right? Like I said, we, we might think that there was that one incident in their life that we can pinpoint or we try to pinpoint and say that was the reason they died by suicide. But that's us on the outside. That's not what we really know. It's, it's all the other stuff that is behind the scene that you know, we want to take a look at when we do the research. So when you're with somebody, whether it's work, family again, if it's a student, if it's someone in your community who has several life events going on or you know they struggle with depression or they have the increased um, use of drugs or alcohol, that's where, we, that's where we kind of take a look and say, okay, this person doesn't mean that they're suicidal or having suicidal ideation, but they might be someone that would be at risk. So that takes us into the prevention. When we feel that we have that that person in our life, or someone we know, or someone comes to us, but someone that they know is struggling, that it's all, it's all adding up to the possibility that suicide might be a part of their life. So we talk about the prevention and, and what other things that would help us prevent suicide. So we have some protective factors. Obviously, we talked a little bit about the mental health care um, situation. As I said, it is getting better um, in our society. Uh, we still have a lack of providers, it's tough. When I work with the kids or I get a call from a parent and they say my son is suicidal and I go and they do an intervention, I call for a uh, mental health counselor to take over from there. Uh, and sometimes they say to me, you know, four to six, six to eight weeks before they can be seen. And that's just unacceptable. I mean, that's, that's uh, you know, that person might not be alive in four to six weeks or six to eight weeks. So, um, you know, as far as a society pushing and advocating for better mental health care uh, would be an excellent way to, to get a better protective factor in our community. Family and um, community supports. Obviously, family support is important. Uh, I think we all know that. Uh, community uh, support. So we have someone introduced themselves to me earlier as a, as a pastor. I think, right? So we have a pastor in the room, a, a, a new one to your community. That's a community support. Our um, 
you know, our, our churches and our, our religious groups are a great way um, for, to have that support, great protective factor, problem solving skills. So this is where I can talk a little bit about the end. If anybody is uh, in a school system um, or, or in the community working with kids, uh, we offer programs most of the time to your community for free uh, to work with kids on you know, knowing what mental health um, mental, uh, mental illness is, knowing what mental health conditions can be, teaching them about depression, anxiety, and working on problem skills, working on, on, on ways that they can take better care of themselves, or if they notice that something is going on in their life, that they can ask for help and that they can you know, get, get on, on the right track for, um, for better mental health care with um, some simple problem, problem solving skills. Obviously, mental health is important. So, as I said earlier, so here's the statistic I was looking for. If 25% of us in this room are going to struggle with a mental health condition in our lifetime, only one of us, one out of five of us, are, are, are getting help for that mental health condition. That's scary. So, there's two reasons. Either we can't get the help, meaning we don't have the insurance for it, or we don't have access to it, we can't get there, or there isn't any enough in our community, there aren't enough providers in our community, or it's just, there's such stigma around mental health that we, we don't feel comfortable enough even going out there and asking for it. So we already talked about this, so you can buzz through this again. Talk therapies and medication have been proven to be the best way of handling mental health conditions. Um, there's also some you know, state-of-the-art other types of treatments that have, have been working well. Now the law requires that health insurance companies cover mental health um, along with your physical health. So I you know, don't know if there's a broad uh, spectrum of what that, how that law reads, but I know that there has to be some um, coverage for your mental health. So mine is you know, very extensive where you know, I could go to see uh, a therapist once a week for, for the entire year and that's covered along with you know certain other whether it's scans whether it's um, you know, any other uh, concerns that I have with my mental health that, that it, it covers quite a bit so if it's someone that you know that's struggling or you're struggling yourself and you want to uh, get some care check into your insurance and see see what it covers as, as it says up there it's they're required by law to have some sort of coverage obviously some self-care uh, it is great. How many of you in here do self-care? How many of us are good at it and do it all the time? Yeah, a lot less hands went out there. So self-care is awesome, but you know we all say, especially people like us who are here as caregivers and, and you know are here because we want to help people, we're, we're probably the worst offenders of doing some self-care. So uh, very important. Uh, along with all of this, uh, you know, obviously is prevention. Um, so if, if someone is struggling with, with any, of, uh, any of those issues, you know, starting with these four basic things uh, are very helpful uh, in, in prevention. Limiting access to the means, we touched on a little bit. It's, it's tough sometimes, um, you know, depending on what the, what the means might be. But again, something simple that might be in your own household, as I said with the pills, would be limiting the access to, to someone around you. Here's some other Things that CO sensors in the, in the cars, they're trying to come up with a law that would require every car maker to have the CO sensor in there. So if someone tried to take their life by asphyxiation, that, that would kick the car automatically off when it reached a certain level. I think it's a great idea. The blistering packaging for medication, people say, well, what would that do? So they'll just take 20 minutes and they'll pop them all out. Suicide ideation could come and go that quick. So if it's tough to get those 50 pills out of blistering packages. In that time, it might prevent a suicide because you can have suicide ideation and five minutes later it could be gone. Not the case all the time, but one hour it could be gone. So any, any restriction of a means uh, can be helpful. Barriers on the bridges, as I said, I'm down in Plymouth. I go over to the Cape all the time. We put those barriers up 30 something years ago when people were dying by suicide off of those two bridges. Um, the one that Kevin jumped off of, the Golden Gate Bridge, number one bridge in our country where people die by suicide. They spent the last 15 years fighting the government there to put up, well, not the government, but you know, the historical society, 
putting up barriers because it wasn't aesthetically pleasing. Okay, so it doesn't look good, but we'd rather have people die. I mean, it just didn't make sense. They finally got it passed last year. They're putting safety nets around there, so that's good news. And obviously, those of you who might have a firearm in your house, uh, you know, to have safety around your firearm, whether it's, you know, a gun lock uh, clip or, you know, a safe. Um, another, another thing for prevention is since we're at higher risk if we've lost someone to suicide, is to have uh, support for those people who have lost one to suicide. So other things, watch, watch out for the warning signs. We're not going to go through a, whole, a bunch of warning signs. We'll go through them quick, quickly, reach out, and seek help. Um, so warning signs, there's usually three factors. It's you know, talk, behavior, and mood that changes in someone's life. That would be a warning sign. So talk, you might hear some of these things. Uh, sometimes someone comes to me and they're, they're so direct. They say, I'm thinking of killing myself. And I say, wonderful. And the reason I say wonderful is because you came to me. Not to them, I don't say wonderful, but in my head. I'm like, wonderful, because that person actually could say it come out and say it. But it's usually not that obvious. You might hear something that's a little uh, less direct, but it doesn't mean that it's just as serious as a warning sign. Behavior, so here's a bunch of different behaviors. So just remember that these are just a small snippet of uh, talk you might hear and behaviors and mood changes that you might see. And when we do our other trainings, we go more uh, in depth into other warning signs, other uh, risk factors. People look at something like giving away possessions. What does that have to do with suicide? When I was first working on the cave again, a, a young man, about 15 years old, walked into a party, handed out to his friends all his Xbox games, all his PS4 games, whatever they call them, and his CDs. And the, his friends were like, oh, that's kind of weird. <coughs> cool, I got a new game. Walked out of the party, two hours later, took his own life. A small little warning sign that if even kids were taught some of these things, would trigger them to possibly get help for, for that person. So mood, all these different, you know, again, in, in with somebody's mood, it's the change. If you took every high school kid, um, you know, and, and, you know, and threw out these moods, you'd see a bunch of them, you know. It's, it's um, you know, it's not uncommon, uh, you know, for, for them to have mood swings. It's, it's when it's different. It's when you feel that it's a little more intense than it was, or that the mood changes on a regular basis. I have three daughters that are all in high school at the same time. You know, that was moody in the house. There's no more mood than you can get in that house. But thank God, not that I'm a subsidial, but at least, you know, if you know that the possibility of those mood changes could mean that they're at risk, we pay a little more attention to them. Trust your gut. So, again, just as it says, assume that all that's going on. You might be the only person that can reach out. And some of us in this room will never, be, will never be able to walk up to somebody and say, are you thinking about suicide? That's okay. But if you know the risk factors and warning signs and know who nearby you or in your school system or in your community could ask that question, that's just as important, even if you can't be the one. So again, just talking about it saves lives. Reaching out to someone. So if you think someone is suicidal, I'll, I'll, I'll jump down to the fourth thing there. If you think someone is suicidal, we want to be able to ask them, we want to ask them directly. We want to say, are you thinking of killing yourself? Are you thinking of suicide? And you say, well, why would I want to say that? Well, one, the research over years and years and years has proven that asking the question does not put it in their mind if they haven't thought about it. So we want to ask that question. If you feel someone's at risk so much that suicide's a possibility, we want to ask it. And let me tell you something. After you ask that question, if someone is thinking about suicide, they are so relieved you ask them. It is the opposite reaction of what you think you would get. The shoulders drop. The kids say to me, how did you know? You know, like, they're relieved. And, and after they, you've opened up that door, you've used the word suicide, and that's been bottled up in their head for a long time with all that other stuff. And once you've said that word, you've opened that door and given them permission to talk about it. And again, it comes back to talk saves lives. If they feel they can talk about it, that's the first step in, in getting help for it. Um, again, everything, everything there is it, it the obvious, but listen to their story. In a suicidal crisis, after someone has said yes to suicide, they want to tell you everything. 
the first thing is the relief. The second thing is they usually nonstop talk because, like I said, you just gave them permission to talk about it. So listen. Try not to fix anything. Just let them talk and, and get it all out. We as caregivers want to fix things. It's our nature. You know, my, my, they come to you and they say, well, my boyfriend broke up with me. Oh, well, you know, you'll meet another guy down the road. That's not what they want to hear. It's not that simple when you're having suicide ideation. To them, that is, you know, that is devastating. That might be one of the 10 things going on in their life that's leading to have thoughts of suicide. So talking and uh, letting them talk and just listening, uh, you know, it's great. And sometimes when you first ask somebody about suicide, they might uh, not say anything. They might be quiet and you have that uncomfortable, uh, you know, that uncomfortable silence. Uh, and that's okay too. Uh, sometimes you've given the permission for somebody to talk about suicide, but it's taking them a while to go, wow, this is, I mean, I really can talk about these things and it's, all that stuff is turning in their head and they're trying to gather the thoughts of what they want to say. So sometimes silence is okay. The way I always remember that is that um, silent and listen have the same letters. In it. So even if, even if you're silent, you're listening. Um, again, obviously avoid minimizing feelings. A lot of people say to someone that thinks about suicide, oh, how could you do that? Well, you're not going to do that, are you? You know, automatically putting that negative connotation on it. Um, avoid trying to, to say that life is, is worth living. That's the last thing they want to hear. Again, they don't want to be pushed and told what to do. And, and some of the attempt survivors that I, I've dealt with say that suicide ideation to them is a protective factor because it's an option for them. They've learned how to go out there and reach out for help, but they have an option. So trying to take that option away from them, they said made them mad when someone said, you can't do that, you, you know that. How could you think that? And put that negative uh, spin on it. What wasn't good for them. They wanted that. Just, you know, let's put that over here and let's see what other <coughs> options we have as a better way to, to talk about it. And again, not trying to fix anything. So if you think somebody's at risk and they're at, at risk soon, simple things here, you know, don't leave them alone. Another case when I first worked on the, was working on the Cape, a, a teacher did the right thing by asking a kid if they were thinking about suicide. The, the, the student said yes. This was in her classroom. She walked out to go to the office to get help, left the kid there. He went out the back door and later that afternoon took his life. So if anybody is ever thinking about suicide or has said to you that think about suicide, stay with them. Get them to someone, get them to help. Help remove lethal means, okay, that's fine. Remember that your safety comes first in this situation. So if you're going to go that route, make sure that you know, it's, it's something safe that you can do. Uh, usually getting someone else involved at this point is, is important with removing um, the, the lethal means. And again, just escort them to somebody. Get that person to someone like myself or someone in your community that's trained to do an intervention. And hopefully within your community, we can come back out, like I said, and get a bunch of people trained on how to do an intervention so that you have a list of people. So when you see somebody struggling, we can, we can notice that and get them to the help they need. The Suicide Prevention Lifeline, excellent number to have. It's an 800 number, 1-800-273, talk, I think that's 3 two, no, 4 two, I don't know. Five five something. Four two five five. Eight two five five. Thank you. Um, great number. It's a it's a national number, but it's when the, when you call in, it's routed to your location. So you're talking with somebody in your area that could have some resources for you or other numbers on how to get help. So it's a great number to just plug right into your phone. So obviously, if there's an emergency, if there's a dire situation, we dial nine one one. Keep your you know keep your safety in mind again. Um, and, you know, I, I think this is a great first step. Like I said, I'm so glad that many of you came out this afternoon. You, you know, you have another resource now, or a couple resources between uh, Shamra and myself, uh, and AFSP, and your local coalition. So, um, you know, I think as a community, we can, we can definitely help save lives.